Welcome to the Journey Mama Writings Podcast. I'm Rachel Devonish Ford, the author of the Journey Mama blog and books, and I'm currently recording my audiobooks. I'll be releasing the Journey Mama Writings complete as audiobooks, but also here in podcast format with Hindsight, which is a section at the end of each episode where I share my thoughts on my experiences all those years ago. This is season one, where I read the book Trees Tall as Mountains, the first book in the Journey Mama Writing series. I write many kinds of fiction, including YA fantasy, inspirational romance, and literary fiction. You can find my books on journeymama.com, and you can subscribe to get my posts or writing in your inbox. This podcast episode is published by Small Seed Press and is sponsored by my patrons at patreon.com forward slash journey mama. On Patreon, my patrons receive daily poetry and other offerings, including early peeks at new books and ebooks when they are complete. I'm so thankful for them. They make everything I do possible. All the links are in the show notes. Thanks for listening and follow me at journeymama.com or on Instagram where I'm at journeymama. Welcome to episode five. This episode contains posts from September 2006 to October 2006. With hindsight. September, September 8th, 2006. I remember the first time that I ever saw Chinua. It was summer. I had turned 18 that spring. He was running down the steps to open the gate for me at the old community house on Ashbury Street in the Haight District of San Francisco. I saw him open the door and jog down the stairs and I thought, um, he was gorgeous. There wasn't a buzzer at that house. We always had to open the gate manually for every person who stepped inside. At the time, I didn't know there would ever be a we. I didn't know that I would live in that house, would walk through it with my husband right before it sold, or that Hate Street would become my home. My friend Heidi and I stepped inside and joined some people who were standing around in the kitchen. Chinua and I started to talk about Canadian politics, a subject I knew nothing about but I'm sure I made a few things up. We had come to see another person, someone we wanted to talk to about maybe doing a little volunteering around the Christian house. The Christian house was in the hate and existed for the purpose of loving kids on the street, being Jesus' love for them, having them over for showers and food. The lady we were looking for wasn't there, so we left. A few days later, Heidi and I helped out with some people who were serving a meal for people in need in a church, Chinua was there with his guitar, playing worship songs while everyone ate. I was serving salad, and the older lady beside me had two things going on. One, a bit of a control issue about the size of the scoop of salad I was giving people. That's too small. No, no, not so small. And two, quite the crush on Chinua. She went on and on about how he came to play all the time at that meal, and that she just loved his voice. Had I heard his voice? and there was just something about him. Since Ms. Perfect Salad Scoop beside me was talking about him so much, I did watch Chinua a bit, and I did listen to what she said about him, and I know this is going to sound like the silliest thing in the world, but what I really thought was, I know him. Except that I didn't. I had just met him. That was all. We left town and went back to Canada. But about eight months later, I ended up volunteering at that same house in San Francisco for a week. I was a shy and gawky girl growing up. In social situations, I was completely self-conscious. I had a few rules for myself, like never let your true feelings be known. When in doubt, be silly. And above all, never, no never, let a boy know that you are interested in him. I had some pretty good force fields. On that trip to San Diego, I had come to the conclusion that there really was no one out there who was interested in a girl like me. I was traveling with five other girls, and we met a lot of guys. 
guys whose eyes glassed over when I started talking about books or art and God. A few things happened during that week. The first was that when I came running up the stairs in the upper part of the house one day, Chinua was walking out of his room and said, I like it that you're tall like me. My height had been such a thing of consternation for much of my life, and this was the best moment of height that I had ever had. Ah, I thought, this moment is what it was all for. My social dance class in the ninth grade, when I was already 5'9 or 5'10, I don't remember. And it doesn't really matter because my dance partner was a boy from Hong Kong named Helmut, who was prematurely gray and hilarious, a great friend, but still half a foot shorter than me. Or all the boys I knew who were my friends and always stood on tiptoes around me to make themselves the same height or taller. It all suddenly seemed insignificant when I was standing beside Chinua, who was six foot two and liked it that I was tall. The second thing is that somehow it came up that I really liked poetry. And Chinua gave me one of his books, a compilation of E.E. E. Cummings poems. Note to boys who like girls who love poetry. Always give her a book of poems. Preferably by someone like Cummings or Rilke. Or, well, anyone at all. It will make her feel like a queen. The third thing was that he asked to see my own poems, and then we sat on the stairs, and he read them while I read some of his. I will remember the way those stairs smelled for the rest of my life. It was a good smell. And after that, I could never walk in that house and smell its housey smell without sighing with happiness. I had no idea at the time. But it is a testament to how smitten we both were that one, he told me that my poems were epic, that they were better than anything he had ever read, better than Cummings or any great poet, and two, that I believed him. The fourth thing was that he took my friends and I out on a tour of the city, and we were hunting in North Beach for this little jazz club he had been to, only we never found it. And the beauty of that night was this. We were silly. We were silly... And we had so much fun that at one point Chinua fell down on the street laughing. On the corner of Columbus and Broadway, he just lay down and laughed. Of course, nobody even so much as glanced at us. And then we played at the playground in Washington Square and spoke in silly British accents. And I have never had so much fun in my life. And then my friends and I left the next day. The whole time it had been dawning on me that if we were standing in a group, Chinua would stand next to me. He seemed to like to talk to me. He seemed to favor my company. It was shocking to this awkward, gawky girl. Looking back, all the signs point to Smitten, but Chinua and I had what I like to think of as the perfect romance, because it was a year and a half later, after many letters and many phone calls, with him traveling around India and Nepal, and me traveling around the States and Canada, and then at the very end of that time, traveling in India, Nepal, and Thailand together, a whole year and a half later that we ever talked about how we felt about each other. It was always there, right from the beginning, but we just didn't open up that can of worms. And we built an amazing friendship first. Eventually, we had all that. We had the romance, we had the proposal, we had the amazing wedding, which was good, because we need that now, as we are celebrating our fifth anniversary with three kids, the youngest still only seven and a half months old, we had three kids in four years and took on some serious responsibility within our community. We've gone through money stuff, kid stuff, my postpartum depression three times. We've traveled together, lived in tents and an RV, lived in two towns and a big city since we were married, been lied to numerous times by people that we've cared for, had things stolen from us. We've written songs like, everything's going to be all right, everything's going to be okay, Everything's going to be all right, no matter what they say, that we sing to ourselves to feel better. We've lived in small spaces. We now live in a beautiful big space. We've swum in rivers, lakes, the Gulf of Mexico, and a few oceans, warm and cold, together. We've been through flooding, storms, and mudslides. We've sat in several broken-down vehicles together. We've danced. We've sung at many weddings. We've tag-teamed as photographers, as parents, as community directors. We've tried to juggle together. We've eaten many different foods, been guests at many different homes, driven down countless roads. We've filled our tank with gas many, many times. We've spoken words that shouldn't be said. We've cried, mostly me. We've been immature and petty. We've made up. We are solid and we are in love and we've been through a whole lot. 
and I can honestly say I've never known anyone I esteem and respect as much as my superstar husband. September 14th, 2006. Kai walked out of his room today and announced, It's not pants, it's pant, while shaking his head in amusement. I smiled. Well, no, it sounds like it should be pant, but we say a pair of pants, so it really is pants. Kai shot me a derisive look, as derisive as a four-year-old with brown eyes the size of teacups can be. No, he said, it's pant. I don't drop these kinds of things anymore because really the kid has to know. Well, you're almost right because almost any other word wouldn't have an S sound on the end like that, but it's pants, trust me. No, it's pant. This is when I had to pull out the old standby. Kai, I said, who's four years old? Me, big smile. And who's 26? Kenya? No, me. Who knows how to read? You do? You know how to read, Mama? And who has been through school? Me again. So you can trust me. It may not make sense to you, but I know the word is pants. You may call your pants pant if you want to, though. I've found that this tactic works well for other things, too, like when Kai tries to instruct me on driving. You were supposed to stop back there, Mama. Kai, do you even know what city we're in? Or cooking and other things, except that I may say things like, who's been driving for ten years and who's not tall enough to reach the pedals or see over the steering wheel? It helps us all remember where we stand. September 25th, 2006. Ever since Kenya became one of the speaking members of our family, it seems that it always consists of speaking members and non-speaking members, although the only non-speaking member right now is the leaf baby, and our pet rats, I guess, she and Kai have found the strangest things to argue about. They really can argue about anything and everything. Listening to them argue makes me want to lock myself in a soundproof box. It is even worse than whining, and it showed itself right after I said that whining was the most annoying thing I'd ever heard. Arguing is worse, particularly because it usually culminates in shrieking from Kenya. It can be pretty funny, though. Yesterday we were all sitting on the couch, and Kenya was staring dreamily out of the window. If I wrote in Kenya's dialect, you wouldn't be able to understand a thing, so I'll write as if she speaks with more than two consonants. Kenya. That's Mama's sky, and Daddy's sky, and Leaf's sky, and Kenya's sky, and Kai's sky. I'm thinking here, how beautiful, what a sweet girl I have. You always wonder about what your kids are going to say when they finally start talking. And then Kenya says something pretty like that. We can only see the tiniest glimpse of it through the window, too, since our trees are so, so tall. Kai. It's not our sky. Kenya. It is our sky. It's Mama's and Daddy's and Leaf's and Kenya's and Kai's. Kai. No, it's not. Kenya, blood-curdling sound that shouldn't be heard within a closed space because of the danger to the baby's eardrums. Me, Kai, it is kind of our Sky, and kind of not, too. Besides, she can say that if she wants to. Kai, it's not. It shouldn't be our Sky. It shouldn't be. Kenya, it is our Sky. More blood-curdling ensues. Me, okay, kids. We are not talking about the sky anymore. Kai, whispering, it's not ours. Kenya, shriek me, no more sky. Do you see what I'm saying here about the soundproof room? Maybe I could just invent some kind of soundproof head. I could walk around with my soundproof head all day and smile all the time because I can't hear the madness. October. October 5th, 2006. 14 and a half ways to improve your spirits. A note to myself. There has been sadness this year. Thankfully, these sadnesses are the light kind. No deaths, no major sicknesses. But sometimes they seem to pile up and they threaten to overwhelm me. I thought I'd write a helpful list for myself to mull over on a day like today when it seems like I'm followed by a sadness cloud that is tied to me by a strong piece of twine. Riding a scooter will do the trick, for a short while anyways. 
My superstar husband recently had a birthday, and one of the things I plotted was a motorbike ride through San Francisco with him. It wasn't too hard to figure out either. We were already going to the city for a meeting. We have an amazing friend named Amelia who watched our kids and lent us her scooter, and she had helmets for both of us. In my black leather jacket and big visored helmet, I looked like a superhero from the 70s. Chinua was wearing one of those little helmets that don't cover your face, and because the helmet was made for a small woman, and he is a large man with plentiful dreadlocks, it was perched on the top of his head like a shiny, hard kippah. He was our black Jewish scooter driver. We zipped down market in deepening twilight, then drove over to North Beach, the very place we fell in love way back when. We had pizza at a sea... We had pizza at a seedy urban pizza place, then sped back over to the mission in the dark to pick up our kids. It was amazing, everything I had hoped, and even the fact that the idle was too low on the scooter and Chinua had to restart every time we were at a stoplight, even that was perfect. He was perfect in his shiny kippah, and I held him around his waist and his shoulders, and I laughed at the dark. 2. Listen to Radiohead's Hail to the Thief album. Sometimes it will lift your spirits just to be really, really melancholy with lots of angst. 3. Talk to the leaf baby for a while. He'll make a combination of faces and sounds that make you laugh until you've shaken all that sadness right out of you. He'll make dolphin sounds, raspberry sounds, squinch his eyes up and wrinkle his nose. You'll want to hold him forever. 4. Read Harold and the Purple Crayon, especially the line about the very hungry moose and the deserving porcupine. That line makes you laugh every time. 5. On that note, read One Fish, Two Fish by Dr. Seuss. Go play a game called Ring the Gack. This makes you laugh too. 6. Listen to your silly husband in the car, people watching. He'll say, where are you going to a woman walking by in a big rush? Not so that she can hear him, of course, or you got some food to a woman carrying a casserole dish down Market Street, or what's in a little green bag to a businessman carrying a tiny green bag with handles alongside his briefcase. All of this is only loud enough for you to hear, sitting in your van in traffic, and cracks you up to no end. 7. Laugh at Kai secretly when he manages to say the oddest things you've ever heard. For instance, when he yells out, Hey! and you turn to look, only to see that he's talking to his pita and hummus. Or when he calls out from the back of the car, I burped, and it tasted like my yummy bubbly juice, and now I'm sad that it's all gone. 8. Buy yourself a new book. 9. Make plans for an upcoming trip to Canada. Okay, so this might actually stress you out quite a bit, but focus on the positive. You'll be in Canada, your home and native land, You'll be able to hang out with your parents, and Becca, and Maddie, and go to your brother's wedding, and smell the air that smells so different. 10. You would normally eat some chocolate or ice cream, but now you are finding out that sugar has a very bad effect on you, and that it gives you a false high that brings you right back into the pit later. Too bad. Eat healthy things and feel happy about it. Think about cells being regenerated and your brain cells being replenished. 11. Mull over that scooter ride again and think about the time that you and your superstar husband rode scooters on tropical Havelock Island in India. Okay, maybe don't think about this too hard, especially not with that gray sky looming. 12. Listen to Kenya laugh. Get a kiss from Kenya or a hug or a touch of any kind because this will give you great happiness. 13. Clean your house. This is calming and methodic. 14. Sing really loud at a gas station. This makes people look, but spreads joy around, maybe, depending on what you're singing and how well. And a half. Drink half of a forbidden cup of coffee, just because. October 12th, 2006. I don't think you can ever know how having a new child will affect your family. How could you? The small person that is your child shines and darkens in ways that have never appeared to you before. Sometimes there is a spark of recognition, a piece of your childhood, the smile of your sister or the eyes of your husband. But this person is new, new to the world and to the small village that is your home. 
With the birth of each of my kids, I died a small death and awoke to new love. With Kai, it was the death of my independent self, a self that spent hours reading and writing and painting, a self that jumped in the car without checking lists or shoving shoes on tiny feet. With Kenya, it was the death of having only one baby, the concentrated affection, the passing back and forth of one child. And with Leaf, it was even more imperceptible. But it was the transition of Kenya being my baby girl to being my middle child. This is what felt like a small death to me. It's what made me cry during that first week. But the awakening, the new love, the kind of love that you never have for anyone else, not even your spouse. Love for my husband is constant and huge in me. But how many times have I watched my children sleep and felt that clutch of pity, the fierce protection that brings tears to my eyes? I've never felt love like this before having these children. It has made me intensely vulnerable, easily shaken, and yet as solid as the hills. I've also watched each of my children's hearts expand with love as our family has grown. They open and blossom and care for one another. And this is what forms them, in addition to the love they receive from us. Leaf has never known a life without a brother and a sister. Kai has received each of his with joy. In all the craziness, the dullness, the frustration of parenting, love binds. Love takes a family and makes them a small force in the world. In all the ways I've changed since my first son was born, the biggest are that I am more loved and that I have more love. October 23rd, 2006. The day didn't start out so bad yesterday. We were driving on one of the loveliest sections of highway in the country, which was made even more beautiful by the fact that the poplars have turned yellow. Bringing the car around curves, I was presented with beauty that soothed all the crazy parts of me. We drove through the dark forest where the sun shot through trees of the brightest yellow and out into vineyards and peace was all around me and the kids chattered in the back seat. The orchards and vineyards in Sonoma were turning as well and there were soft hills of fiery little trees spreading in every direction. We're leaving for Canada this week, and I'm hustling to get everything taken care of before we go. Chinua has a flight to Israel from Seattle on Thursday, and will be gone a little over two weeks, which means that we need to pack and prepare. Stat. I had some book working I had some bookkeeping work to take care of close to the city, so I zipped down and did it yesterday, taking in some psychological trauma as well, just for kicks. I had the two older kids with me. In trying to configure who would take care of which children when both of us had great swaths of work to cut through, I settled on taking Kai and Kenya, thinking that they'd be the best for the seven-hour round trip, while the leaf baby would be the easiest relatively to take care of while working at home. Those big, long naps are great. By relatively, I really mean relatively. It's funny how you get to saying, wow, this is so easy, I only have the two kids to take care of today. I imagine in the larger families, they say, shopping was a cinch. I only brought five of the kids along. We just had to make one brief stop at Target. Can you hear the creepy music? I don't know why so many of my life events happen while I'm on shopping expeditions. I guess it's a comment on the nature of parenthood, the weekly fourways into the wilderness of Costco, the way my whole life seems to be reflected in one little shopping trip. I mean, how many times can you walk through Costco without going absolutely freaking insane? Oh, they have their Christmas display up again. Wow, has the whole year passed already? What's that? For Halloween? A man-sized scary figure? Oh, Costco, what will you think of next? I've also shopped at practically every Target on the West Coast. Living in the woods means that you stock up when you can, so we shop wherever we are, north or south, east or west, this town or that town. Yesterday I was in Novato, a town to which I will now never return. And all I needed to buy was long underwear, socks, pull-ups for Kenya, who by the way is now a whiz at the potty, and a Dora the Explorer DVD for the kids to watch while I was working. They have one, which they've watched 700 times, and I figured that I was pushing my luck by trying to keep them occupied with it again while I worked. I picked it all up in record time, didn't go near the clearance racks, and checked out. We were on a tight schedule. Then I walked out to the parking lot and realized that I didn't have my car key. After this, a lot of stuff happened, 
including me retracing my steps 17 times, searching on floors, under displays, in the bathroom, in the bathroom trash, and in the trash at the entrance to the store. I caught some looks, let me tell you, and I realized that some people saw my shopping cart with two kids in it and assumed I was looking for food or cans or something. I started to make little remarks, standing there with my arm shoulder high in trash, messing around with the melting ice cubes in the bottom of the bag, desperate to find my key, like, I really have to find that key, and oh kids, I hope we find it soon, to let people know I wasn't looking for leftover hot dogs. Seriously. As if I would ever score food from the Target trash cans. The dumpsters behind Whole Foods are a thousand times better. My superstar husband said that my mutterings probably didn't make things look any better. I hassled guest services until they were ready to throw me out and called all of the locksmiths I could find in the yellow pages. They were all closed on Sundays, except for one 800 number where the lady told me that new keys started at $120 and up and that they wouldn't be able to tell me how much it would cost me until they got there. I don't want to mention how, but I've had a key made before and it was $80 and I didn't want to pay any more if I didn't have to. Okay, okay, it was an incident involving the beach and the vast expanse of sand at the shore, as well as shallow pants pockets and my little car key, but that was years ago. In between trips to guest services, my kids took turns falling apart. I walked around with a worried, stressed-out look on my face, with two kids in my cart who were pulling hair and generally losing their minds. It was nap time for Kenya, and after three hours? Three hours! My kids weren't even trying to listen. I wasn't holding out to find the key at this point. I just couldn't even locate a locksmith. I was literally stranded at Target. And at one point, I looked at the man at guest services and asked him to please show me the way to where they kept all the bathroom trash once they emptied it. They started to think about calling security on me. As I was calling the police, a last-ditch effort to find a local locksmith, an angel in the disguise of a Target team member, ran up with my key. I have never seen anything as beautiful as that girl, standing there with her red shirt and khaki pants. We left in a hurry, since we had been there for over three hours, and we didn't exactly have three hours to spare when we left that morning. We drove the rest of the way. I worked, the kids were delighted with their new DVD, and I was ecstatic that we didn't have to pay money that we really didn't have for a new key. You might think this is the end of the story, but you'd be missing the part where we finally left, hungry and tired, to drive the long drive home. We stopped to get gas, and I couldn't find my wallet. It was gone. I'll give you some hints. I located it in the very same store that my keys had been lost in earlier. The very same boy that I had been hassling about the key handed my wallet to me in a polite and embarrassed for me manner. I cracked some joke trying to get him to believe that this wasn't an everyday occurrence for me and scratched the Novato target off my list of places that I can show my face ever again. The list is getting shorter and shorter. October 31st, 2006. If you walk into a coffee shop in Canada and order a coffee and then meander over to the counter where you doctor your coffee up, You won't find a container of half and half like you will in the States. You'll find a container of cream. What Americans called half and half, Canadians call cream, and heavy cream is called whipping cream. What Americans call a stocking cap, beanie, or various other words, Canadians call a toque. It's French, like serviette, which a lot of Canadians say instead of napkin. On a sign that indicates a place to use the toilet, you'll see that it's called a washroom here in Canada. This has caused a lot of confusion as I've asked for washrooms in department stores in the States, and they look at me as if to say, you want to take a bath? Now I know to ask for the restroom when I'm in the U.S. The sofa in your living room may or may not be called a Chesterfield if you are Canadian. This word is fading with progressing generations, but every Canadian who speaks English as his or her first language will know what you mean if you say the magazine is on the Chesterfield. Canadians take out the garbage, Americans take out the trash. When an American says he's pissed, he means he's mad. When a Canadian says he's pissed, he means he's drunk, really, really drunk. For angry, he'll say pissed off. 
I'm in my musing, sort of melancholy, philosophical world of being in Canada, trying to figure out what is so different about this place that I can literally feel it in the air as soon as I cross the border, and why it makes me so sad to be here. Sometimes I feel like an imposter. I've adopted Americanisms. I say, huh. I do all the time. I say trash, I say restroom, and I say semi instead of semi when I'm talking about a big truck. We're in Victoria, and as we drove past the Parliament building, it was night, and the old, beautiful building was lit up with thousands of little white lights. There is a song by the Innocence Mission from their Small Plains CD, and I'll just quote the whole song here, because it pretty much ex exactly describes how I'm feeling. Song about traveling. A man said, why, why does traveling in cars and in trains make him feel sad? A beautiful sadness. I've felt this before. It's the people in the cities you'll never know. It is everything you pass by, wondering, will you ever return? A sweet and sad song, and add to that the sorrow that I sometimes feel about not living in the country of my youth, and you have how I feel. Well, add some relief and joy over being with my family right now, some adoration of my kids, as well as some general frustration about the little crying party they all decided to throw at six this morning, some desperate missing of my superstar husband, and some real homesickness for, can this be America? Gasp. My home now, my redwood cabin, my community. Life is so strange, all the little loves and hurts, the way I love my family and I love my community, the way my home and my husband are intertwined. The way I miss Canada, miss British Columbia, but have come to adore Northern California where I met Chinua, where we have our life together. And then there are those pangs of nostalgia for India, for Thailand. This earth is vast and there are homes everywhere for me. And yet it is not my home at all. And that is why this constant search under tables in lit windows as I'm passing by, the search for home is not futile. It's as if God holds my home in his cupped hands. Hi, here are the hindsight notes for season one, episode five of the Journey Mama Readings podcast one. So yeah, one of the things that I noticed came up in me as I read this was kind of a patronizing attitude toward young Ray because she's so excited about five years of marriage. And now I'm 20 years in. So I'm like, whoa, that's not a very long time, Ray. And it seems adorable. But at the same time, I realized that those first five years are kind of important. And a lot happens in those first five years. So getting through them is really it's really big, and it's important to see and know and honor. Yeah, so it's just funny to read it, though. Um, I talked about that woman who was critiquing my salad servings, and one of the things I thought is that actually I know a lot of people get crushes on Chinua, you know? It's not, not in a weird way, but just in that way where they want to see him and know him and talk about him, and they're super interested in him, just like the woman who was standing next to me that day. And you guys, Chinua really did tell me that my poems were the best in the world, which looking back, yeah, it's so funny. Um, it's very sweet. It's also funny that um, it's kind of cute that I had printed out poems that I carried out around with me. Back then, we printed out everything. We didn't have phones. We didn't have phones with screens, you know, so we, yeah, I printed out those poems. Actually, I didn't have a cell phone at all at that time. And so I carried around my printed work. Um, it's also nice reading this at a time when I've come back to poetry so strongly. It's really important for me now. And I think, yeah, just super important to me to have poetry in my life. And it was always important, but I'm really making the time for it now. We were just talking the other day about being close friends. And... It really was important for us to start out as friends. The fact that we waited so long to really talk about how we felt about each other was important. I think it developed a habit of friendship for us. And that's been life-changing because 
over the years, like, you know, you, it's like this bit of wisdom that I didn't really understand that you marry one person and, and then you just both continue changing and, and growing. And so the fact that we have got, we get along well has remained, even when other things have been extremely hard to go through. For example, I don't think we really realized what grief would do to a relationship. Um, a few years back in 2016, Chinua's best friend Ian died. And we were kind of like struck down, I guess, in a way. We couldn't really talk about it. It was so hard to go through it together. We couldn't, it wasn't something that we could feel unified on, I guess. I know grief has not come to us in the same way that it has come to many people. Um, and it's really hard to go through things like that in a friendship, in a relationship. So there has been so much change over the years, and a constant good thing has been our friendship, how much we really enjoy each other. Even age, you know, age is one of those things that changes a relationship because you're a different person at 48 than you were when you were 27, you know? It's just, it's just a different person. And so being able to remain friends has been really important. We've gone through some hard years, and... Yeah, I'm thankful to come out the other side of those hard years. And I know that there will be hard years ahead as well. There are quite a few things I can add to the list of things that we have been through together. Um, I kind of had that little list of things that have gone on for us. And yeah, I can add quite a few things to the list now. Two, little Kai. Anything at all about little Kai is enough to make me lose it. He is... Honestly, I can barely think about baby Kai. And even the other day, I was talking to Chinua and I was saying, um, you know, something about baby Kai. And he was like, I can't. Don't make me think about baby Kai. I'll cry. Baby Kai had the biggest eyes. Little Kai, I should say. Little Kai had the biggest eyes in the whole world. And people used to tell me that he looked like, um, you know, those Ethiopian icons with the really, the curly hair and the really wide eyes. People used to say he looked like one of those icons because his eyes were so big in his head. Um, yeah, he moved out last year. And he's actually just now, like ye as of yesterday, come back to us. Um, he'll be living about three hours away. But last year he moved across the world. And for different reasons, he's going to wait out some time here instead of being across the world. But... I think there's not a lot I feel written enough written about this stage of parenting, what you do when your job has been to work yourself out of a job, I guess. And we're nowhere near done with that with him, you know, he still needs us in many ways. But it's interesting to, I don't know, to reflect on this little guy at the same time that I'm helping the nearly 20 year old Kai now. And it was pretty clear that he, he felt that he knew a lot, even from a very young age. And he did know a lot from a very young age. That has continued. Three, the earliest of fights. Fights have always been the thing that I cannot handle about parenting. Of course, you know, I'm the mom. I can handle it and I will handle it. But everything else is fine. Cooking all the time, the amount of food everybody eats, grocery shopping, taking care of things. I'm not into the details. I hate the documents, but I can do it, you know, but fighting just throws me for a loop. And this was only the very beginning. Now I have five children and they get along really, really well. But when the fights happen, it's just a lot to help people sort through conflict. And for all of us, we need to learn how to sort through conflict. So I'm glad that, um, yeah, I'm glad that for all of us that we're able to do that with siblings or friends as we're growing up. For, I wrote about things to do while melancholy. Riding a scooter is still it for me. Yes. Um, wow, I'm, I'm thankful that I get to live somewhere where I can ride a motorbike around, at least for now. And I take it out into the hills when I need to get away. It still really helps me. And I still love to listen to angry, angsty music. I definitely still love to talk to Leafy when I'm sad because he is always interesting and funny, even more and more over the years. I don't read Harold and the Purple Crayon as much anymore, but it is still an amazing book. And my husband still makes voices for people. 
He does it for people on TV or on the street. And then the kids do it now as well. And so f- that's really funny and fun. Also, buying a new book is still 100% amazing when I'm, when I'm feeling low. It's interesting to read that I thought sugar had a bad effect on me. I don't really think that's the case anymore. I think what was going on is I was too caffeinated and I thought it was sugar. So I had a lot to learn about feeding myself when I was back at this age. I would skip meals and then binge on something. Um, I would not make time for meals for myself. I would eat leftovers of what the kids were eating instead. I still had so much to learn and I've gotten so much better at it. Eating well is one of my strictest things now. Um, I'm not that strict in what I eat. It just has to be regular and contain lots of fresh things. And I mean, and when I say I'm not so strict, I mean, um, I'm not, you know, like no carb or low carb or anything like that. I just really try to eat a lot of fresh things, good vegetables and stuff like that. And make sure I do it regularly and I don't skip meals. So those are the things that I find at this age that really are helping me. And I am so thankful to be in Asia again. Kenya also is still helpful to hang out with when when I'm sad. But now instead of my baby girl, she's my grown girl. And I go to her room when I'm feeling melancholy. So I can just like lump around. That's what we call it. We call it lumping around in her with her and in her room I lay on her bed or talk to her or just read in there her room is a haven of peace and it's beautiful she's just a she's just a good person to be around and I should try singing really loud outside again that could be good one cup of coffee is usually my limit these days for sure five new children what would we do without leafy I can't even imagine I don't know I had another, yeah, I had another two kids after this, and I can't imagine being without either of them either. Six, another store meltdown in Target. I have had so many in America. I don't do well in large stores, and there are so many large stores in North America, in Canada and the, and the U.S. So this doesn't happen as much anymore, but boy, it happened a lot back then. And seven, I had nostalgia for Thailand back then. Now my nostalgia is for Canada and America, also in India. And we've been kept away so long because of this stupid pandemic. So um, I'm missing it a lot right now. I have a lot of nostalgia. I miss the scents. I miss the clean air. I miss all of the things about the places that I grew up and lived in before. But more and more, I'm learning to find home within That's all the hindsight notes for this episode. And thank you again for joining. I hope you join for the next episode. Hi, everyone. Thanks again for listening to the Journey Mama Writings podcast. I just wanted to hop on here and let you know again where you can find me. First of all, credit goes out to Chinua Ford, right? the incredible song that goes along with the podcast. He did such an amazing job of writing this beautiful song, and I'm so thankful for that. I have new things out. I released a book of poetry called Everything Bright, Clear, and Beautiful, and you can find that on my blog, journeymama.com. You can also find the newest book in the World Whisperer series. It is the sixth book in the series. The plan is for it to be the last book in this series, but I do have the universe open for a new series. So do not be afraid. We won't be leaving them yet. That's called Crown of Stars. You can also find that at journeymama.com forward slash books. And the biggest thing that I want to tell you guys about is that I am going to be hosting a writing course and that is starting on January 2nd. I will be teaching this course for 10 weeks. It's going to be two live sessions a week. If you can follow along live, that would be great. If you want to join in this course, um, that's at, I think it's at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on Mondays and Wednesdays. And if you can, everything will be recorded and you can do it at your own pace. So you can check out the course. It's at journeymama.com slash writing 
dash from dash the dash heart dash one. Um, or the easiest way to find it is just to go to journeymama.com and click on the thing that says writing from the heart up top in the top menu. Yeah, check it out. We would love to have you there. Uh, we still have spaces available. And it is my first course. It's about writing. It's about writing your own story. It's about learning how to write your story. And we're going to be going step by step together, writing together, learning together each week. And yeah, kind of having a little community of fellow writers. And I want there to be a, an amazing amount of joy and a gift in it for you. So there is going to be another discount. We had an early bird discount, but now this discount is for the rest of the month. The course closes on the 27th and the discount is $200 off and you just need to use the code LIGHT at checkout. So that is, yeah, that's my desire for you that you would learn to write your story and that your story would be a way for you to get through the days. Just like if you're listening to this podcast, you can see how that has really helped me. I also have a newsletter that goes out once a month. You can subscribe to that at journeymama.com forward slash subscribe. You can also read my blog at my website, journeymama.com. You can find me at Instagram. I am at journeymama. You can also become a patron and sponsor this podcast and many of my other works. So yeah, there's lots of places to find me around the web. Follow along. We love to have new people in this little community. And I'm so thankful that you are listening and reading along.